Russia's answer to bridge the gap in a highly connected but fractured world. Connectivity through barriers in geography and policy. From St. Petersburg, World Insight with Tianwei ponders the answers. Talent Fuse, straightforward interviews, go beyond the headlines. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tianwei. Our program today is coming to you from St. Petersburg, here in Russia. No one is going to be the winner of a trade war. That has been widely believed by many of the participants in those halls of the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. People are interested in the result of the upcoming visit by the U.S. trade delegation to China. They're interested in this not because they're interested in the two countries, China and the United States, but rather than the bigger issue, what is going to happen to the international trade system if the two of the world's economies are not necessarily going to see eye to eye with one another. Before we go to the discussion, this first. Three days of this year's St. Petersburg International Economic Forum were devoted to building an economy of trust. The forum's slogan emphasizes the idea that without trust, all efforts would be in vain, be it in meeting current global threats and challenges or work on the world economy and business. Global lack of trust brings into question the perspectives of a global growth. The logic of economical egoism doesn't match with today's specialization of countries and companies with building complex global production chains. It can actually push global economy and trade back to the past, to the era of natural economy. French President Emmanuel Macron also said we need to develop a multilateral approach to solving international issues. Europe will only be able to move forward if it is at several speeds as it is nowadays, but if it is so assumed, always having the door open for those who are ready to reach it. As a result of mistrust, trade protectionism is making a comeback. Discussions at the forum voice concerns about the trend's impact on global economic activities and growth. International Monetary Fund Chief Christine Lagarde says nobody wins in a trade war. The protectionist threats that we are hearing, the tariff threats that we all talk about and have in mind, clearly constitute a threat to that confidence in international trade. Opportunities alongside challenges to globalization are a priority in improving global economic governance. To this end, it is wise to adhere to a multilateral system and carry on with mutually beneficial cooperation, leaders said at the St. Petersburg Forum. Among the participants of the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, there are business people coming from all over the world, and some have witnessed the world's economy when they are in the ups and the down stages. Jim Rogers is one of those. He is one of the most well-known world investors, and also he has been the co-founder of the Quantum Fund. He recounted at the time when trade war was not working, and he wondered whether it would ever work in history. Let's listen in. Trade issue between China and the United States. Chinese Vice Premier Liu He was with his delegation earlier in Washington. Eventually the two sides come to certain kinds of consensus for now. We understand that the Secretary of uh, Finance, Mr. Ross, is going to come to China once again early June. So what is likely from your perspective? The topics to be discussed from now on. Well, they want to have. The, they don't want a trade war. At least China doesn't want it, and some people in America don't want a trade war. The business community and the agricultural community in, the, in America has said we don't want a trade war. So at least for the moment, it's it's been calmed down, and I hope it stays calmed down. And we don't have it. The risk way is that later next year, when the economy gets bad in the U.S., then Mr. Trump will look for a fight because he thinks he, a trade war will win 
he can win the trade war, and he thinks that the trade war can be blamed on China. <laughs> it's, it, it's incorrect, mm. but that's the way he thinks. We notice from the Chinese side that there is going to be commitment of purchases of American agricultural products as well as energy products. Uh, but, of course, China did not commit at all to the so-called 200 billion U.S. dollars that Trump administration was put out there uh, as so-called a target. Uh, what do you make of the next stages of negotiation interactions when the two economies are getting ever closer, but at the same time having bigger possibility of going another direction? China is being very smart. They know that Mr. Trump won the election because of agricultural states and energy states. Those states voted for Mr. Trump. The Chinese are trying to make them happy, and if they can make them happy, then it will help keep the trade war down. Mm. That's what his voters are. He knows that. China knows it. I know it. Everybody knows You've it. You've been dealing with uh, President Trump when he was still a business person. And, uh, of course, probably uh, that you know him better and the logic of his uh, better. Uh, what do you think is the desire of his right now in this negotiation? We understand this White House is pretty much uh, coming with one voice. That is from President Trump. First, I should tell you, I did not ever do business with Mr. Trump. Uh, but what he wants is to be reelected. That's what all politicians want. That's what they do. They can't get a real job, so they go into politics. They want to keep getting elected and keep power. Mm. So what you're saying is agricultural products, energy products, that's going to contribute to Mr. Trump's political power and the possibility of being reelected. If you get out the map and look at the states that he won, they all produce agriculture and they all yeah. produce energy. Yeah. Mr. Rogers, one of the other thing is the White House is also different from the business community and also the other political apparatus in Washington. Uh, some argue that the current negotiation is an effort coming from the White House. Others argue it is a concerted effort coming from different sides of the society. You yourself, one important member of the business community, what do you think is the nature of the, the current discussion? Mr. Trump is trying to get reelected. And all the congressmen and senators are trying to get reelected too. And so they look at their base to see what they need to do. And Mr. Trump thinks that if he's tough, uh, looks tough against foreigners, it will help him get reelected. Mm -hmm. One of the things people look at these negotiations and think about the two sides is that what is likely to be the outcome for China, besides commitment to the <coughs> United States to purchase more. Um, China is also on its way to further reform. How much do you think the current round result can contribute to China's own efforts of pushing for more structural reforms? I hope China continues to open up. I mean, if I were China, I would open up completely today. I'm not China, and they don't have to listen to me, and they're not. Uh, the risk, of course, is that this will encourage hardliners in China, the ones who don't want to open up, and say, see, you can't trust any, you can't trust the foreigners. That's the risk. Otherwise, if, if they do buy more from America and they're happy buying more agriculture from America and China needs agriculture, then maybe it'll continue to open up. I hope so. Mm. Can you China imagine a completely open China? What an exciting country. It already is exciting. The more it's open, the more exciting. This year, of course, uh, Mr. Rogers, the 40 years of reform and opening up anniversary. I know. I know you came to China very early in the years and went around China even on motorbikes, but the thing is whether China will still have the guts to push forward further reform. That has been a topic being debated inside China a lot too. I know it has been. As I say, the risk is that the hardliners who don't want to open will take the courage from all of this. Now, most young people in China want to open up more and more and more. Some of the older people still remember the old days, but eventually it's going to happen. Mm. China's going to be the most important country in the 21st century way. It may take longer, but it's going to happen. Mm. China has been committing over the past few months, as if you could listen to the speech by President Xi Jinping at the Boao Forum, Mr. Rogers. Uh, he been, you were there. I was you were there. Yeah, we were meeting there. each other. Yeah. And Ms. President Xi has been committing about the auto industry import tax reduction and many of the other issues, financial reform as well. How much do you think of the speed 
that China is taking on when it comes to the next state of reform. I heard his speech and it was a very uh, enlightened speech and it was showing restraint. I hope it continues. As I say, wait, I would open up everything right now. Right now. I would announce on CGTN. Every, finance is open, auto, everything is open. They're doing it at their speed. I cannot tell China what to do, but they're doing it. I would just do it faster. The debate about technology and the intellectual property rights, Mr. Rogers, is a big one between China and the United States, with the ZTE issue uh, going on over the past few weeks and still lingering on. Uh, Mr. Rogers, China, United States, the trade, eventually the real essence of this debate, what exactly is it? Boy, let me tell you that China and the U.S. are the largest economies in the world. They're both vibrant, dynamic economies. They could work together and really be very, very rich. Are you, very, are you being very idealistic, Ms. Rogers? Why? They're two very open, uh, two, two very important and rich countries. If they work together instead of fighting each other over foolish things, can you imagine the two countries working together, how exciting and prosperous both would be instead of these foolish squabbles about nothing. Now, China has to open up more. Don't get me wrong. China does need to open up more. But the two working together instead of squabbling, wow, that could be very, very exciting. Mm. And from the business perspective, I understand there are so many different interest groups in the U.S., as you may know, better than anybody else than Mr. Rogers. The thing is, what you are hoping for, are they also the wishes of the others. Some people always suffer if they're open markets, yes. But for the most part, there are over 300 million Americans. Most of us would be better off with cheaper goods, better quality goods, and more trade going back and forth. Yes, there's always somebody who suffers. But that's the world, that's life, that's history. You cannot change that. If mm -hmm. you don't want anybody to suffer, where would you go? <laughs> Maybe the USSR, but it didn't work here either. It didn't work out. Uh, Mr. Rogers, do you think the Americans know this? Americans, I mean, well, generally some, speaking. Some, no, some, some. But for the most part, yes, if Mr. Trump goes on TV and says the foreigners are bad, everybody nods and says yes. The president said foreigners are bad and they must be bad. You realize our conversation is also broadcasting in the United States. Well, does that make it not true? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's correct. <laughs>
now President Putin being re-elected into the Kremlin and the lineup of uh, all the government posts being fulfilled right now? Well, the, the changes that I've noticed at the forum over the years, is they usually reflect current events. Right now, everybody's worried about uh, trade wars, sanctions, international trade. Last year, that was, not a, that was not a topic. And you also, I noticed, many, many, many international businesses are here. They want to do business in mm. Russia. And even American businesses are here uh, in, a, in big time. So, so far, everybody's worried about it and talking about it but also everybody still wants to engage mm. and trade. Mm. And everybody is concerned about the current stage, whether there's going to be trade war or not, as you just said, Mr. Rogers. Wait, everybody, most people know that trade wars have never worked. Nobody wins a trade war. Everybody knows that. Mr. Trump wants trade wars. He's wanted them his whole career. But most of the rest of us know they don't work and that they hurt everybody, including the people who start. This. Recently, Chinese President Xi Jinping, Mr. Rogers, asked three questions when he was meeting with the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. He asked the question whether economies in the world should be more open or closed. Open. Whether there should be win-win situation or one person, one country take home, meaning zero-sum game. Win-win for everybody, but everybody has to open. Should there be more reforms for everyone, or everyone just being conservative, so-called? Now, everybody in Beijing knows the answer to those questions, just like I know the answer to those questions, but Beijing also has to open, too. Yeah, well, finally, before we go, Mr. Rogers, Given your knowledge of history, after all, you've been an investor in the world for decades. Given your very direct and straightforward style as well, what would you say if you were being asked by leaders of the world, some of the major economies, China, Russia, United States, about what do you think of the economies? Where should the country go? What would you say? Well, I would say to, to China first, because it's the second largest economy in the world and it's more closed than most. Open up. This is not 1918. This is 2018. China's rich, powerful, successful. Open up and do it. And we will all be very, very, very happy. Mm -hmm. I would say the same to America too. Don't close off. Don't close off. Open the borders. Open the economy. And let's all succeed together. And Russia? Oh, to Russia the same thing. Russia's doing it. I, it's astonishing. Here we are in the home of Lenin. Lenin, Stalin, well, Stalin wasn't here, but they were all here. And they're opening up amazingly, much more than most. They have a convertible currency. Not even China mm. has a convertible currency yet. They have very low debt. China has more debt than Russia now. China, Russia's doing amazing things. All right. This is the home of Stalin and Lenin. Look out the window. It's amazing how they're changing. Jim Rogers, one of the most well-known world investor, huh? and also co-founder of Quantum Fund. What a pleasure to have you always. I love that direct style. Boy, I love being, I told you, it's, smart. it's good being with <laughs> smart and interviewers. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us here in St. Petersburg once again. And you are watching a special edition of World Insight coming to you from St. Petersburg. We'll be back after this. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight, and I'm Tian Wei. I am now standing in the city of St. Petersburg in Russia. The St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, just to wrap up, many people here and around the world are extremely interested in the result of the upcoming visit of the U.S. trade delegation to China and how the two of the world's economies will tangle with one another for the final trade discussion. Before we go to a discussion with two experts, let's take a look at this. Another round of consultations. U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross will lead the delegation to China from June 2 to 4 to lay the groundwork in fixing simmering economic and trade issues. The arrangement was confirmed in a phone conversation last Friday between Ross and Chinese Vice Premier Liu Ha. Liu visited Washington earlier for high-level talks. The world's two biggest economies agreed to back off slapping tit-for-tat tariffs on hundreds of billions of dollars worth of goods. 
The biggest achievements of this round of talks is that the two sides agreed to resolve the current China-U.S. trade dispute through dialogue and cooperation and not to start a trade war. It sends a positive, strong and powerful signal to the market and stabilizes the market's expectations. Washington and Beijing are reportedly putting the finishing touches on a deal over the Chinese telecom giant ZTE. The deal is expected to be cemented before Secretary Ross arrives in Beijing next week. It would lift the ban that's keeping the firm from buying American parts. In exchange, China will import more agricultural products from the U.S. and ease tariffs. Uh, they can pay a big price without necessarily damaging all of these American companies, which they are, because you know, you're talking about tremendous amounts of money and jobs to American companies. The trade friction between China and the U.S. is also on the agenda of the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. Speaking in St. Petersburg, Chinese Vice President Wang Qishan said China would go all out in fixing trade disputes with Washington, but it should be ready for any turn of events. We have to be sensible and be calm. Our President Xi Jinping said some important words. China does not provoke, but China is not afraid. In our view, there are two sides which lose in a trade war. Analysts say the Chinese and American economies are highly complementary. There is great potential for bilateral trade, and China welcomes high-quality and competitive U.S. products entering the Chinese market. The U.S. Commerce Secretary's visit to China is expected to help better sort out trade deals. Andy, James, welcome to CGTN. Thank you for having us. It's great to have both of you here. One of the things people talk about is the China-U.S. trade issue, things both of you are coming from the business community. Let me ask you, James, what does that mean to you, this current round of debate? Yeah, it's hard to put any kind of positive spin on what's happening on the trade front. If it is hard, then don't do it. Uh, okay, then I won't do it. Uh, it's impossible to put a positive spin, really, on, on the disruption uh, of the free flow of, of, of trade and investment between two countries that are becoming increasingly integrated um, and have become increasingly integrated over the last 15, 20, 25 years. Um, and to see, to see policymakers uh, interjecting uh, themselves into that process to try to unwind some of it, potentially highly disruptive uh, to, to trade and investment, mm. uh, yeah, difficult to see how, how there's a positive story there, to be mm. honest. Andy, as an economist? Well, I think in the short term, I think the, uh, uh, the risk premium in the market is rising. <coughs> and uh, you never know what could happen. So uh, yes. I think the, uh, the financial market has been very buoyant for, for many years, uh, partly due to risk premium dropping uh, a lot. Mm. The market is very expensive. So I think that uh, the market will run into trouble in the next few months. And uh, in the long, from, from a longer term perspective, uh, multinational companies uh, uh, will have trouble uh, kind of uh, uh, planning forward. How are you going to source your components from everywhere in the world yes. when uh, in this kind of environment how do you make a decisions mm -hmm. where you, you you should base your next factory so those decisions are really uh, being put on hold because of the uh, of the this dispute and putting on hold is a dangerous thing because efficiency is extremely important That's when you run a business in an ever-changing world having said that though james the reason people study the u.s china trade relations is not just because they are China and the United States, but rather a trade dispute in the current circumstances, eventually what is going to be a way to figure out a solution mm -hmm. and what is going to be the way for countries, national governments to work with the business community. That is the key thing. James, um, if you look at what is going on now, it is mainly still the governments that are taking the leading role in terms of where the trade policy is going. Do you think that will be the case for the future rounds of discussion between China and the United States? Well, I don't think it's only governments. So you can be assured that the U.S. government is hearing a lot from the U.S. business community because there are many 
of the largest U.S. corporates yeah. uh, invested in China with an interest in the continued access from China back to U.S. markets. So I suspect that the U.S. government is already hearing a lot from, from the business community, mm -hmm. not just with that issue, but with the NAFTA issue, yes. uh, which is potentially disruptive. So when you have economies that have become integrated over time, to try to disintegrate those is, is highly disruptive. Mm -hmm. And that's disruptive not for government officials, but for, for business. Well, the K Street which is lobbying the street yeah. in Washington, D.C., or will it be the national interest, depending on what the national interests are, eventually making a decision? I think that uh, the, uh, the uh, China or other Asian countries usually look at the United States uh, politics from the perspective of influencing Wall Street people or business leaders, mm -hmm. maybe some uh, uh, politicians like uh, Henry Kissinger and so forth. But are we, what do we see is a uh, new force coming up, is yeah. uh, this uh, populist movement. The origin of this populist movement is that uh, the wages has been has stagnated for 40 years. So most people in the United States have lost out right. uh, in, in, uh, in the last uh, four, four decades, and uh, they are very angry. So th this anger is driving uh, political process. So now we have a kind of a, you still, we still have like business leaders, Wall Street people still trying to hold, hold the, 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 this together. But I think they cannot hold it, hold it down. Mm. In the next cycle, when, they, uh, do, when, when they, we have uh, another recession, which surely will come, I think that the, the politics in the United States will be extremely different. Mm. So this is why I think that the, uh, unless China is prepared to deal with a complete different United States, mm. to understand uh, why the people in the United States are angry, uh, and uh, maybe China should uh, do some reforms uh, that would less, lessen the tension. Otherwise, we're headed towards uh, a very, very difficult yeah. period. When one country <coughs> has to handle with its own structural reforms, United States and China all included, what can others do to lessen so-called the burden, as Andy earlier argued? Could that be done in any way? No, I think Andy is absolutely right. I think the, uh, you know, there's, there, there's a, a large group uh, in, in, in most advanced economies that now feel sort of left behind. And the, the median income levels or the average income levels haven't really moved. In some ways, the rich get richer yeah. and poor get poorer, you know. That, we that, understand that. that. that the that, thing that is, whether message. you could do anything outside that country to change that country. Oh, that's difficult. That's I think the it's difficult argument, to, it's, isn't it? Yeah, it's very difficult to do it from within, let alone from, from outside. So I think that's a, you know, that's a tall task, yeah. I, su I suspect. We will be dealing with, I completely agree with Andrew, we will be dealing with this, these issues for the foreseeable future. The, the, the question is, how do you adequately address the actual core problem of whether it's people being uh, left behind or mm -hmm. income levels not moving higher across the board? Right. Um, and then you know, addressing the core issue rather than what some politicians sort of lazily identify as the issue, i.e. it's cheap imports coming from somewhere else. If I put a stop to the cheap imports mm. from somewhere else, I'll get your job back. I mean, that's the, the sim very simplistic message. But that resonates with, with people mm. who, who, who seem to have lost their job to import competition. Mm. And that's... Uh, a message which isn't accurate, but it's one that, that uh, is... It is, is winning. Uh, it's, winning the, it's winning the day to some yeah. degree. With that in mind, Andy, you said China can do something, but what can China really do? Uh, you got already a big price tag, a 200 billion coming from the Trump administration, which China, of course, would not going to promise to do because that's not the way one sovereign country is working with another sovereign country. Have you said that, though, is there any way out, Andy, from your perspective? Well, I think that China, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 the, uh, the key problem in Chinese economy is that uh, household dis disposable income is too low. It's about 45% of GDP, and uh, it's, it's basically, that's the cause of uh, consumption, mm. is 36% uh, of GDP, extremely low for a country of uh, $10,000 per capita income. So, uh, uh, and that means uh, too much investment and overcapacity yes. and so forth. And uh, the people that, that those are the problems that other countries complain about. Right. So I think China can do something about it. Household disposable income should increase to 60%. That's normal. And uh, consumption should go to 
about 50 percent. Mm -hmm. That's normal. So when China's economy is normalized, I think the tension in the world will not completely go away, but it will come down quite mm -hmm. substantially. But of course that takes time. But we could also, it takes the efficiency to implement the reforms, Andy. Well, I think that the key thing is that uh, China, uh, uh, first thing is to stop it, uh, uh, making the, uh, stop it, Propping up the property bubble because of the property bu yes. property sales like uh, new property sales 15% of GDP that's it twice as high as it should be and then basically you're taking money away from mm. the people right so people are fearful if they're going to have a place to stay at or not so that's keeping the uh, the household mm. uh, consumption uh, down the other is that taxes are too high fees are too high and uh, what's the point of a government uh, spending so much money it just doesn't make sense mm. the government is not very efficient so I think that China needs to become a normal economy most money should be spent by household sector mm -hmm. not by the government. Right. Having said that though, there's another layer that we see in the issue. While the United States and China are in their intense trade discussions, there's another layer about how emerging economies are going to assume uh, a fair position of the world in proportion to their contribution to the global economy. Here I want to go to James. Mm. I have to say, rating companies have been under controversy over the past years when emerging economies and their business are prospering. One of the things people say is rating companies are not treating these companies coming from you know, emerging developing countries with the same standard or with the same standard but not necessarily to the real situation of these companies. Mm -hmm. James, what would you have to say? Well, we have an interest in, in being as fair and, and as objective as, as we can because if we're not, we're undermining the, the, the very product that we're, that we're selling. I mm -hmm. mean, the rating itself. So the rating has to be comparable from one country to, to another. We spend an inordinate amount of, of our time in the discussions that we have about countries' ratings making sure that we are being as fair and objective as we can and we're mm. setting aside any, any personal biases or perceived Western biases or, or anything like mm. that and trying to look at countries, again, in a very kind of objective manner. So we have a, we have a published criteria yes. uh, that doesn't, it doesn't favor uh, one group of countries or, or another, mm. try to be as, as clear as possible in mm. terms of what drives the ratings. I mean, one thing to, to, to think about is, is, you know, the European financial crisis. Yeah. And so now there are a number of Western European countries that are not rated in the AA and the AAA uh, rating categories that there were before. There were some slipped down to double B and to the triple B uh, range. So yes. some of those criticisms of uh, emerging markets always on the lower end of the rating scale not really true anymore mm. because some of the higher rated countries have migrated lower, some of the emerging markets have, have migrated mm. um, higher. Mm. So I think there is a, a little bit of a rebalancing in terms right. of the, the rating profile going on in and of itself. Uh, rating is only one of those examples, Andy, I have to say, among many economic and trade issues when it comes to so-called standard. Who is designing the standard? Who is designing the rules and whether those rules and standards are fair to everybody from whose perspective? So Andy, about those questions as economists, what do you think? Well, I think <coughs> the, uh, 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 the, the world is uh, uh, obviously is biased uh, against, uh, in particular, East Asian countries. Why would you say that? Yeah, you look at it uh, during the 90s. James, I'm going to come back to you. You look at it, the, uh, uh, the people in East Asia have completely different attitude towards that from the uh, other countries. Mm. So, like, a, like a, uh, uh, in 1997, 98, uh, we had a huge debt crisis. But uh, countries that, that, that they tightened their belts and paid off the debt. Yes. This is very different from uh, uh, the experience in Latin America and offer in, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Southern Europe. Exactly. We the, even the, see the South Koreans putting their own gold to yeah. the country and say, use this. So, so, these so that we the, pay our debt. Yeah, the risk is, uh, uh, cannot be judged by like, uh, just uh, looking at the uh, debt to GDP ratio, uh, trade balance, and so forth. You mm. look at the uh, Argentina now is in some sort of trouble again. For, for, uh, for in the last few years, mm. they, they, uh, they got a, a much higher rating than they deserved mm. because yeah. uh, these countries bank, uh, uh, didn't, uh, did not pay back the debts for many, many times. Well, before. I'm not sure whether those countries really agree with you, but uh, 
and the, the question is, what exactly are you arguing about? Should we change the rules? For example, should James change the rules because of his East Asian yeah, countries yeah. and East Asian companies? I think that you look at the country's historical record is very important. You know, uh, if a country has always paid, uh, paid off its debt, mm. uh, foreign debt, you know, that, that they, they deserve to have a, 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 a triple A rating. Mm. Look at the United States now; they treat they, at the peak of the economic cycle, its fiscal deficit is five percent of GDP. Mm. You wonder how they're going to pay it back. Now the the the, the, uh, the national debt is one hundred percent of GDP now. It's uh, it's increasing by what? It's uh, increasing by. Uh, a trillion dollars every year. It's, it, I, I think that uh, it, it, the Western countries all have very high debt levels now, and uh, uh, they, they they will have that trouble. It's a mm. it's a matter of time. A big concern from you. I could read about that. So but the thing is, where is it going from here, uh, James? Um, one of the things people talk about is, you know, the current system, whether it is the United Nations or the WTO or some of the other things are mainly established after World War II. And one of the major builders of this system is the United States. Mm -hmm. And that was based on the principle of multilateralism. But now, with the current administration in Washington, it seems that the U.S. is walking away from these systems that they originally built. So here's the credibility issue. Here's the issue coming from emerging and developing countries say, hmm, you guys told us this is going to work. So once we come in and become part of the winners, and you guys walk away and say this is not going to work because you are not the biggest winner or you are not as big as you used to be a winner. So James, I think that is also an ultimate question to be asked. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, uh, being accused of sort of moving the goalposts, if you, yes. if you will. That's right. um, but let's be honest, you know, emerging markets are responding in, in their own way and taking ownership of, of some of this on their own, not waiting for the advanced economies or the Western economies to recognize their, their, their leadership credentials or their place in the world, if you will. And I suppose something like the Asia, AIIB, the Asian mm. International Investment Bank, is a good example of that. So that is a, you know, or the new stuff. development bank, or by the, the new BRICS development countries. bank. Uh, again, a very good example of that. Which is going to be the major or the mainstream trend? I think that would be an interesting question, Andy. Yeah, I think the uh, the, the the world order that uh, was established after the Second World War is really falling apart. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, to uh, to reestablish, uh, to maintain the order, we need to have a new deal. The New Deal, uh, all the countries uh, need to sit down and uh, renegotiate the United Nations system. For example, uh, the WTO system, it, as the way it, it is, it's not sustainable. Because and, uh, the, Amer the United States Americans complain about uh, uh, industrial subsidies. Uh, most countries do it. So there are no standards. So if you have free trade, you don't have a, a standard on uh, subsidies, then it's not sustainable. Mm, mm. So we need to uh, put everything on the table and uh, renegotiate. Before we go, the U.S. delegation is coming for another round of discussion with the Chinese side. Any wish, at least some warm advice for both sides? James. Uh, not, not necessarily advice. Coming but, from a native you know, Canadian the, the, and yet working around the, the globe. You know, the wish would be that we see some progress, although I'm not, to be honest, I'm not that hopeful that, that we'll see much happening. In, but we in hope the they work hard. We hope they work hard. Yes. And Andy? Well, I think that uh, it takes time to reach a compromise. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the, the compromise, when, the, when, and when it comes, is not a solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, both sides will be very unhappy. And this internal anger will, will fester. Uh, later again, and then we'll have uh, uh, next year we have another program. You know? So uh, we need cooler important. minds and also we real need leadership. A vision. Somebody needs to put a uh, uh, vision on the new world order on the table, and has the ability to persuade all the other national leaders to buy into that. Wow, that's a lot of quality you're talking about over there. But for now, I want to thank both of you for having the real quality for a very an intellectual discussion with us. Thank you so much, uh, James and Andy. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Really appreciate it. A conversation on the sideline of the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum about U.S.-China trade dispute. With that, we're coming to the end of today's program. On behalf of my team here in St. Petersburg, 
I'm back in Beijing. Thank you so much for being with us. And bye for now.